Hi everyone, Don Peterson. Here is another lesson from the library. Today's book I pulled off the shelf is Putt Like the Pros. Now this was written by Dave Pels and um, I met Dave. He came and, and did a, um, a little seminar for the Georgia Section PGA several years back and um, I thought a lot of the ideas uh, about his putting I could, I could relate to. Um, I was a pretty good putter. I always have been a pretty good putter and um, when I was younger, I, I could make everything. So, uh, again, some of the philosophy from this book goes right in line with uh, things that I teach. So let's take a look at uh, what he offers up here in his book and see if there's some things and tips in here that will help you with your game. So I'm just going to go through a few things that he talks about in here. Um, very similar to what we've heard now through some of the, the newer um, gurus, the putting gurus coming up with all the science from today, um, Dave found that a lot of the touring professionals, they, didn't, they weren't able to set up consistently. Um, but the ones who set up the most consistently were the better putters. So obviously being able to put the club face down and put your feet in the right spot and put the ball in the right spot are the hardest things to do. Making a good putting stroke might not be as hard as actually aligning correctly every time. So he found that the better putters could set up and put the face down there um, the similarly every time. Whether it was square or not didn't really matter. There are some pros set up with the face one or two degrees closed, some set up with the face one or two degrees open, but if you do it consistently every time and then the ball position is the right, right spot, that was one of the things that I, I personally think is very important, especially if you're an arc putter versus a straight back and straight through putter. So there was a lot written in the middle chapters about the mechanics of the stroke um, one of the things that uh, Mr. Pels came up with and uh, he was adamant about was how the triangle, the, the two arms and, the, and the, uh, the shoulders then, if you form a triangle there, how that stayed intact. So there was very little movement in the wrists. He, he didn't like to see any wrist movement, didn't like to see any forearm rotation or forearm movements. Uh, wanted to see the shoulders and the arms and the wrists and the grip and everything move as a unit. Um, that's consistent with, I think, a lot of putting philosophy. So uh, if you can get your, your wrists and your arms and uh, your hands to be really quiet uh, during your putting stroke and move with the bigger muscles uh, around your shoulders, that, that would be key. Also in the mechanics, um, he found that from the lower body, um, try to restrict movement down there. You want a stable base of which to putt around. Now, modern technology will tell us that there's actually movement down there, but that's because we have three-dimensional now. We have sensors, and sensors can, can uh, monitor even minute, small, imperceivable motions. So we now know that there might be a little bit of hip movement or a little bit of legs or actually even weight transfer in a putting stroke, but should we try to eliminate most of that movement and make it stable and still? Yes, I think that's probably true. And I think most putting gurus or putting teachers would tell you to try to keep your lower body almost completely still and make the motion predominantly around your spine or around your shoulders rocking around your spine. Now on the front cover of this book, you'll see D Dave Pels is standing here next to a little, uh, looks like an erector set of, a, of a, a, a crane or something, but it's actually what he calls Perfy. And uh, Perfy was a, was a little model he made of a, kind of a human being. He wanted a, he wanted a, a structure of a human being so he could kind of study the putting stroke. And um, one of the things he tried to prove uh, with, the, with Perfy was that you can have your hands below your shoulders and you can make a straight back and straight through putting stroke as a human being. There was a big controversy um, back then and there still is probably today of whether you can make a perfectly straight back and straight through stroke. Um, Pels seemed to believe that it was possible, made this model to prove it and, uh, and then went on to write a book about um, how to make a nearly perfect putting stroke. So I think you can picture that if you put your hands below your shoulders then you rock your shoulders then you can have a perfectly straight back through straight back and straight through a path of your hands but then you've got the shaft and the club face. Um, Pels uh, liked putting the putter in a track and having the the putter go back and forth on a track so he built a track and that was how he 
uh, taught a lot of students. A lot of putters uh, develop a path just like I did. I grew up and I just put the, the putter head up against the baseboard on a wall and just rocked my shoulders. So I kept the face going back and forth and that helped me develop a straight back and straight through putting stroke. You know, I obviously trained my muscles to do that. So if you train your muscles to make a good path, then that's part of the battle. And Pels likes to say that th that's about 20% of the battle. Uh, the other uh, percentage is, is face. And he, he wanted to say that the, the face was much more important than path. And obviously at the speed that your club head is traveling and putting, um, he, he, he made it sound like it was more like billiards balls. If, if you had your face slightly closed, it's like the, the ball would come off at such an acute angle, d depending on how open or closed the face is, kind of like hitting the side of a cue ball. It's going it's to uh, send a, uh, the ball off in a different direction. So Pell's talk, talked a lot about the face and how important it was to keep the face um, you know, square at impact, obviously, but he thought about the face being uh, square back and square through. In other words, always facing at the target. This is actually something that I try to preach in my putting uh, to my students too, especially those who are beginners. Uh, if you've got a stroke that already has an open and closing face during the, the stroke, or you swing on an arc, then I'm not gonna change that that much. But if I'm developing new students who are trying to learn how to putt, or if I'm trying to help a student who has a terrible putting stroke, I might have them try keeping the face straight going back and through. This makes sense to me because if the face is always pointed at the target, it doesn't matter where your ball position is. If the ball position is up in your stance, the face is still gonna be square to the target if you hit the ball up in your stance. And if the ball's back in your stance, the face is still square to the target. So I've always felt like my ball position could actually move around a little bit. It didn't matter because I was always taking the face, um, keeping it square as I went back and forth. My uh, putting coach when I was younger, my um, golf coach in college, he used to, he says, man, it looks like you hood it when I go back and then I'd open it coming through. And I think that's what kind of happens if you develop your stroke that way. Um, it looks like it's shut going back and open when you come through, but that's tr truly just keeping the face facing the target, going back and going through. So a lot of what Pels was trying to do with Perfy, the perfect putting machine, was he was trying to um, say that, yeah, it's okay if you get your hands directly below your shoulders, your hands can make a straight back and straight through path, and if you can make that happen, then you can get your putting path going straight back and straight through, and then you can keep the face facing the target, and that's the most consistent way to putt. Now, in today's day, we have much more information. We've got 3D technology, as I mentioned, and a lot of that can help you uh, or help us learn what the pros do. One of the, some of the top pros we found out, um, they actually, um, instead of pronate on the backswing, like you do with a, your golf club, they supinate. So during the backswing, there's some supination in most of the top putters with their lead forearm or lead hand. What that tells you is that they're making an attempt with their hands and the wrist to keep the club face from opening too much. So even if it opens a little bit and closes a little bit during your stroke, you want to you want to uh, keep it to a minimum. You don't want it to open and close too much. And I think that kind of throws a wrench in the works of some instructors out there that are teaching um, letting the face open and close to create a better roll. Um, maybe that creates a better roll, but maybe it's not as an accurate of a roll and, and you, you'll miss more putts. Uh, that's for you to decide. I'm just throwing out information that I find has helped me and information from putt like the pros from uh, uh, Dave Pell. You know, it's funny always when you read books or when you reread books, or you go back and look at information, you see things sometimes you never saw before. Something sticks out to you. It's like, wow, that's really, really a, a great thought. And that's what happened to me when I was going through this book. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a reference in here to Pell's talking about you know, he wants to see a stroke. When, when, he, when you hit a putt, he doesn't want any hit in the putting stroke. And um, I've always felt like that too. It's like, I just want to make this perfect stroking motion. I uh, don't want to hit at it. Um, you know, we, we talked about years, years about accelerating as you went through. And I think it's, it's an acceleration that, that's caused by just the length of the backstroke, backstroke. So if you have a long enough backstroke, you have the, plenty of time to accelerate without actually hitting. And I think that's key, and that's what Pels was talking about, 
In fact, he went on to say he doesn't want to see any muscular effort in there, you know, where you're hitting. And he wanted to see everything passive and just letting the, letting the club just truly swing. Um, and I had a kind of a revelu revelation because in short game you kind of have the exact same thing. I always tell people and who have trouble with their wedges, if you take it back there and there's kind of a punch or a hit, or if you feel the need to punch or hit, you're probably, you either pick the wrong club or you pick the wrong swing or you have the wrong thought in your mind because you, you want to just let that thing accelerate at its own speed, just like Pels is talking about putting. You don't want to have to hit at it to create the correct length of putt or to create the through motion. Um, so keep that in mind when you're putting. Try to take all the muscular effort out of your hands and arms and wrists. Again, it goes back to being quiet and rocking, the, rocking that triangle back and forth. I think uh, one of the big things that Pels was um, recognized for in this book was his 17 inch rule where he talked about the correct speed, how he always wanted the ball to go about 17 inches past the hole. And the way he uh, figured this out was he, he came up with what he called the lumpy donut. <laughs> it's kind of funny because if you look at a, at a golf hole, you know, the golf hole is four and a quarter inches. And of course, people would go up and they'd pull out the flag stick. So people would come up, everybody who walked on the green would walk within about a foot of the hole to grab the uh, the flag stick, but nobody nobody ever stepped within six or eight inches of the hole. So the, the the turf was perfect right next to the hole, but then for about three feet around the hole, around that donut, I guess you'd call it, the donut hole was the hole plus about six or eight inches on the outside. Everything else was kind of mashed down and lumpy. So his thought was that you needed to have a putt that was rolling fast enough to go through the trampled down area and get to the hole um, and, and not be deviated by, you know, the turf that was kind of a lumpy uh, trampled down area. So if it were dying on the hole, you might get the ball to roll, you know, sideways right when it got to the hole. And you see that from time to time. You see balls that are rolling right at the hole and all of a sudden they just dive off because they just don't have enough speed. And you think to yourself, oh, that's because I didn't hit it hard enough, but it's also because the the, the turf is, is worn and, and, and uh, trampled on and, and uh, maybe lumpy, just like he said. So one of the things I'll tell you about Dave Pels is that he, uh, he was one of the first golf professionals to step away from just teaching golf and say, hey, I'm going to specialize in an area. So he decided he was going to specialize and, and teach people putting. And um, he delved in and, and learned more about putting as a, he had a science-minded science, science person. Uh, so. He found out things like 43% of golf, the game of golf is putting, so a lot of statistics. Um, he, he studied the putting stroke and balls missing left and right. And, uh, so he's, he's uh, I think you could say he paved the way for a lot of uh, specialization then to come years later in golf instruction. And now we see, um, <laughs> you might see a touring professional arrive on the site with his putting professional and he might have his full swing professional, he might have his nutritionist, he might have his exercise specialist. There's, there's all kinds of specialties now in training for golf and uh, I guess we can, we can thank Dave for getting some of that started. Oh hey, you looking for a game? Come on, you can join us. Don't forget, like, subscribe, and ring that bell and we'll notify you next time we come out for a game.